you can go to caretakerpress.org. That will direct you to uh, the listing on my site. If you just want to look at the listing and what we've done, um, feel free. And yeah, you go there. The submission guidelines are there. And send me a story. Hello, writers and crafters. I'm Valerie Isan. And I'm Eric Mertz. And this is episode 148 of the podcast, and it is March 13th, 2024, as we record this. Today, we're going to talk about anthologies and the different um, approaches and different sides of being in an anthology or running an anthology. So that'll be a fun topic. Uh, we want to say a big, huge, juicy thank you and hugs for existing patrons. Thank you so much for believing in our work here on the podcast and also offline. Become a patron of the arts at patreon.com slash Valerie Isan and patreon.com slash strange air stories. Um, we got a couple more subscribers on the YouTube channel. I just saw the other yeah. day. So yeah, you can always check us there. If, if, uh, listening is not your jam, you can watch us on YouTube at uh, writer craft podcast. Um, announcements. The registration is open for the 2024 writer craft writing retreat and workshop in Marcola, Oregon. Um, you can go to valerieisoncom slash retreat for all the info on that. Um, do you have any announcements really quick before we do author? I got updates? a ton of announcements. I mean, oh, I'm all, all right. Full of announcements. You're full I mean, of announcements. All right, bring it. Full of announcements. So uh, <laughs> yesterday... <laughs> Yesterday, I put out um, I, I put out the the announcement that I've you know starting a new series. I've been talking about it, you know, kind of teasing it a little bit. Um, but I have in my newsletter today. Any any subscribers to my newsletter um, will see the cover to the first book in the uh, season in the bush series called the story's called Dead Still, and yeah, it's it's on. It's on. It's out there now. The world the world can see it on my newsletter and there'll be subsequent announcements on social media and places. So I'm super excited. Dead still is ready almost ready to go. And and it's it's book one. Book one is so exciting. Book one. So book one. Story one. Actually, it's it's a novella. Say, the whole book series. One. Okay. Yeah. The whole series will be um short ish um i'm not like i've written two of the two of the book books in first draft and they're they're about 35,000 words um so yeah it's going to be a short read kind of series it's sort of intended to be you know if you're into horror this is your you know you're sort of this is your horror beat read um I would, that's kind of what I thought of it as like kind of a light book you can bring to the, it's not really a beach that I have in mind. It's kind of more like a swamp. You know, if you're going to, if you're Cemetery. going, hey, hey, horror fans, if you're spending your summer vacation at a swamp or a cemetery and you need to read while you're sitting out on your, on your chase lounge, then this is the one for you. Um, yeah. That's the way I thought, thought about it. It's just like, kind of like, you know, my version of a beach read. And um, yeah, so Dead Still probably is like no, short novella. The rest of them are a little longer novellas. And I'm super excited. It's going to be great. Awesome. Well, and that's going to come in a, a newsletter, you said? Yeah. So subscribers okay. to my newsletter right now will be getting that. Um, it's it's going out as we speak. It's doing that thing where it comes out at different time zones. So oh. I can watch it like. You know, so the, it's a cover reveal. Um, there's also, you know, I'm looking for beta readers. So if anybody mm -hmm. would like to beta read this little shorty, uh, you know, please hit me up and I would love to send you a copy of it. But we're going to try to have the first book out, the first short book out um, at the end of the month and, you know, maybe early April and then try to roll some books out. It, it follows the book. The series follows a baseball season. Um, it's about a baseball scout who's like sent to a kind of a, a place he's never been before. He's sent to central Indiana and in the process of going to central Indiana, he ends up like traveling back in time 
and finds that the town is has a different name and there's something there's something uncanny going on in town that he has to figure out um so it's on one hand he's you know he's out there doing he's he's out there doing his job as a baseball scout but he's also investigating like you know why did this the town change names in the course of the time that he's um in, in the time travel mm -hmm. gap and he's trying to figure out what happened um so yeah that's it's really cool so but this is different than the other series that you're starting entirely different there's no there will, there will be no crossover prolific you're amazing i was thinking of i was thinking thank you i was i think i was thinking of putting like a tiny little easter egg in there somewhere like maybe you know have a character from this place in this series and just maybe but like that's like a little Stephen like King a little melville sort of easter egg is that what you're talking about well just you know have a character from so that this is set in lagoon county indiana um mm. that's what it's the and the town is called black springs okay and and he's going to black springs in 1964 but when he gets off the train it's called plainview and it's 1941 and he can't figure out why he's traveled back in time and then he's but he starts to figure out that this place became known as black springs for a reason and he has to he's kind of figured out kind of like in a quantum leap sense like well i've i traveled back i guess i've got to figure out why but also as he's you know he's on assignment as a scout so that's where he was going in 1964 following his assignment as he arrives in this new town, he's like somebody's greets him as though he were on assignment. You know, mm -hmm. they're there at the train station to greet the in the baseball scout to give him the, the mm -hmm. rundown of so he's like, I'm supposed to be here, but why? And, yeah. You know, it it it's it's a period piece. Um I love that era. I love like the I mean, I love all eras, I guess, in in some <laughs> ways. Like they're all interesting. So it's kind of fun to play with these, like, you know, he's a guy from the sixties who's living in the forties and he's, so it's fun. I love time travel. So it's fun yeah. to play with the little time travel tropes. Like, oh my God, I just handed that person a quarter from 1961. What are they going to do? Mm -hmm. you know, he has the change in his pocket. Um, you know, World War One or World War Two hasn't happened yet. So he's, you know, kind of adjusting to this, like he's, you know, kind of, and there's like a, that, that tragedy where he knows that a lot of these boys are going to end up fighting in world war ii or, mm -hmm. and so he's there's a, yeah so there's like a little bit of history pressure time travel pressure but yeah he's he's got to figure out why he's here and that's exciting prequels, it's fun i it can't was wait so to much read fun. it and i just have to say hats off i'm wearing a hat so i'm going to take it off um i interviewed a guy who was a professional baseball scout for a book project i'm working on in january i'm going to do a video on this for my next newsletter Mm -hmm. Um, and we talked about base. I love baseball. We, we talked about baseball scouting. He got me to read some books about baseball scouting. And as I'm reading this book, I thought these baseball scouts are like, kind of like old vaudeville. Like they're just characters. <laughs> they're just rich with like nuance. And I mm -hmm. just immediately got the character The the main character's name is Cyrus Grieve. <laughs> and he's like, I just, I had him, you know, he's a baseball man and the story takes him. He, he ends up, I'm, this isn't spoiling anything, but he ends up befriending um, an orphan in town. Who's kind of a street kid. Mm -hmm. And she's sort of like becomes his guide. Cause she knows the County. She knows everything that's going on in Lagoon County and she's able to help him. And so it's a little bit like paper moon, that old movie with Ryan O'Neill and Tatum O'Neill. That's an inspiration too. So it's fun. Let's just say it's fun. Nice. That's exciting. Um, so author update. Let's see. I did have a reading last weekend. Um, it was kind of a two-parter. So the and we'll get into this maybe more in the weeds during our main topic, but so Tsunami Press released an anthology. And there were like, I can't even remember how many authors, but it was loaded with poetry and prose and short stories and essays. And, and so we had eight, they did a, a, a book release party at the bookstore 
and they did it Saturday night and on Sunday afternoon. So there was a total of 16 people that read from the anthology. So eight on Saturday and eight on Sunday. So I attended both, cool. you know, in support of the launch. And um, I read myself the piece on Sunday. So my friend who was a poet also in the anthology was there Sunday to watch me. And after I went to their house, uh, her and her husband, I went to their house afterwards just for a gathering. And she told me this story that was just so moving. And this leads to my author update. So that's why I'm telling you the story. <laughs> right, right. So, um, so the, the essay was called Eye Contact, and it's about homelessness, basically, and, and how I personally, um, I don't want to say the word deal with it, but like how, how it affects me personally and, right. and how I manage my emotions around it. And just experiencing houseless people in your day-to-day -day life. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so my friend went home from the launch party to walk her dogs and along the bike path, along the river path where she walks her dogs, a lot of unhoused managed to, you know, hang out there. So right. there was one such individual that started following her around and really wanted to sing <laughs> to her. He says, I won't charge you money. I just really like singing. <laughs> and because she had heard me speak about this, she did an uncharacteristic, you know, like she wouldn't have done this normally, but she was like, all right, you know, it's not hurting anything. I feel safe. Okay. You can sing to me. That's all he wanted was just some audience. And so she let him sing her song. She, uh, she thanked him and then she moved on. And as she was walking home, she was thinking to herself, oh, I could call my dad who lives in another state and and, you know, tell him about this experience and he will find joy and appreciation in this experience. And this might be a way that we can connect. So she told me this when I came over and it was so gratifying because at the event, you know, people came up to me afterwards and thanked me for the essay and said it was really moving and, you know, they feel the same way and, you know, all this stuff. And so that was cool to hear and touching. But this experience proved to me that, you know, it touched so many lives, just hearing this one essay, you know, it touched her life and the homeless person's life, and it's going to improve the, her relationship with her father. And so it just really affirmed for me, like, this is why I write. And so I've created this little affirmation um, because I don't want to blame it on, you know, the month in Turkey. <laughs> but right, that didn't right. help. Um, and there's some pivoting, you know, that I'm doing in my business for, you know, with the life coaching and the author coaching and the, and, and I've been writing some nonfiction and for authors. So my writing world is shifting and pivoting and stuff, um, which was why last week's conversation was so, you know, helpful to me um, about pivoting and, and reset buttons and stuff. So I'm percolating on these different, you know, writing pivots in my head. And, and so because of all of this stuff that's been happening in my personal life and also in my business life, I haven't been writing words very often. Mm. And, and I have emotions about that and judgments about that and limiting beliefs about that. And so I wanted to reach out to my community, my, my mailing list, you know, my fans more often, because that's one thing that I really let slide a lot. I can't seem to, you're so good at your newsletters and your prompts and they're interesting and funny and full of, you know, valuable information. And I want to have a robust, you know, routine of writing newsletters or just staying in contact with my with my author with my fans I guess you can call it with my mailing yeah. lists and and my patrons and and just 
yeah, people on social media, even just people that are following my fan page and stuff. So I wrote it an affirmation. And so the affirmation is, um, this is how I create joy and change people's lives. And that's meaningful to me. And, and so my, my plan going forward is to spend 15 minutes a day. I'm just going to set up like a Pomodoro and, and write to my audience. I don't have to publish that every day. I don't have to post it on social media. It might, I might do that. I might, you know, let it ruminate and it might become part of a newsletter. It might become an essay for my patrons. Maybe it'll, you know, be added to a book or something like that. But I want to get into a more um, um, intuitive and also like quality connection vibe, you know, with, with my listeners, with my readers. And so I want to start doing this practice and I think it will help kind of get over, it'll help me get over that like professionalism, perfectionism, I mean. Do you know what I'm saying? I think I that do. stops I me do. a lot. You know, I don't like, I'm trying to write this really meaningful thing that everyone that listens to me will say, oh, that's so wise. And, or, you know, this will change right. my life. And, and that's a lot of pressure. <laughs> I just need to like write some words and put them out there. Um, so I'm just going to have a practice of writing for 15 minutes every day, specifically to patrons or fans or, you know, people on my mailing list. And then I will decide what to do with that thing. Yeah. You know, every week, something will come out of it probably, but that'll just get you know, me I, writing a little more often. I think at least, you know, in yeah. that, in that area. I just I started working with a digital marketer. Um, for all the reasons that like, I don't see, I and I appreciate your compliments, but I look, when, when I look at what I do, I feel I am in that, I, I feel like I'm constantly 40% of the way to where I need to go with those kind of things. I'm always <laughs> like, you know, gosh, when am I finally going to get there? When am I finally going to get there? And I think it's part of the product of that, that, that is, it's a product of like, I don't know, I'm on Facebook looking at authors who are making six figures a year on their authored books and they have 25,000 newsletter subscribers. You know, you, you see this thing. It's mm -hmm. like, Oh my gosh, I'm never going to get there. It's FOMO. You're comparing yourself to other people. And um, anyway, the, I, this digital marketer, like we went through my business, like every aspect of it, like ev I, 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 two hours of conversation with this guy, we covered everything. Um, things I'm doing, things I'm not doing. And one of the things he kept saying, and, that I think applies somewhat to what you're saying is you don't have to do everything. Everything that the, the thing that you should be doing is the thing that feels natural. Mm -hmm. if, it, if you're, if you're forcing yourself to do it, then don't do it because it's going to feel forced and it's going and the people who are, you're trying to reach are going to sense that you're forcing it. And then you're never going to get there. So when we went through, it was like, he said that early on in the conversation and it was very, liberating just to say, okay, like, I like doing this. Mm -hmm. I don't like doing that. And I could see him. He's building this map as we were talking and of what I like. And, and he just basically, I could see him emphasizing like likes to do this, doesn't like to do that. <laughs> and I could see him building this thing. And I started, that's my mind started going um, there. Like, okay, I like doing this. I don't like doing that. I'm not, maybe I should just forget about doing that. Mm -hmm. So what I is the, it's... what, tell me one thing of, of the, that, that you're going to let go of because you don't like doing it. I'm really curious now. Um, this will help other people let go of things they don't like to do too. So. Um, well, I think it's, 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 I, I don't want to get too deep into the weeds on it because I'm still kind of getting my head around it, but. Okay. If it's too soon, then you don't have to say No, anything, no, it's but... not. It's like when I write blogs, I tend to write blogs for the algorithm. I write blogs so that Google's picking up keywords. Mm -hmm. I'm not, I'm writing it with a reader in mind, but that reader is also so laser focused on a single keyword rich answer that it doesn't feel natural. And he said, if I'm going to digitally market you, what I want to do is take your blogs and I want to take them apart 
and find these very approachable little pieces and use those very little approachable pieces as content to put on LinkedIn, to put on Facebook, to put on all these places where you should be reaching your ideal, ideal customers. Mm -hmm. So I like, there's a side of me that's always like, you're, you're doing this for this. And I just have to let go of the fact that like, you know, that, that I have to let go of the idea that anything you do as an author or a business person is single use. That blog is not simply to juice the algorithm to get the SEO engine going for you. It's actually for both. You're trying to attract the Google, the Google gods, but also create <laughs> stuff that's usable. And it's oddly enough, that's the way I think AI is taking search and everything is it's, it's taking it in this direction where, um, the things that people put up online should be intuitive. And, but I hadn't grasped that. So I'm like letting go of this idea of just myself as this sort of this search engine tickler and more as <laughs> dog is growling <laughs> a little bit of a balance, you know, a little more of a balance. So. Mm -hmm. I had a writer friend I met at while well, I'm at writers um, conference years and years ago. Actually, I think it was the same it was the same year I met you, Eric. Her name was Oh my gosh. Susan Prunty, I think. Oh, Susan Prunty. Yeah. She Shout has... out if you're listening, Susan. <laughs> yeah. He's one of the best bakers I've ever she brought those cookies for her agent. Remember that? She brought those cookies with the cover of her book in icing on the front. <laughs> and she's like, Well, I have a couple if you want one. And I thought, well, I don't really like cookies. I took one bite. I said, I love these cookies. <laughs> <laughs> she was um, so great. So when she, when I first met her, she had a blog and her, her plan was she would, it was a book reviewing blog, but her husband was like, at the time, I don't think they're still together. This is not no. a book review. And I was reading through it and I just loved it so much more than book reviews. So what she did, so speaking of like writing intuitively and not doing it the way you're supposed to do it, you know, doing it the way you like it and attracting the people that love that, she would um, bake a cake or cookies or something. She would, she would make a baked item based on the book whether it was, you know, like a theme or, you know, a character or the colors, you know, that came up, uh, you know, when she was reading it or, or whatever, but she would write about the book and how it made her feel, but not even really talking about the book. Does that make sense? You know, she was yeah. just talking yeah. about her experience of spending time with this book and then creating this other piece of art around the book and because of the book. And it was really interesting. I loved that blog. I don't remember the name of it. And I'm sure that that, you know, all the all blogs that we had 30 years ago have gone by the wayside right. <laughs> 20 years ago. I used I to have one called Insane Parents Unite. <laughs> <laughs> I, I it was think it's totally a mommy blog. And I was writing about my homeschooling adventures. <laughs> right. Right. Now got archived. My kids in Cub Scouts now, like in Cub <laughs> Scouts now, and apparently there's a lot of homeschooling in Cub Scouts. So I'm curious to see if I can tell who's homeschooled and who's not. Mm -hmm. Um, I, that I, 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 my friend Jim, who I'm publishing an anthology with, which we're going to talk about in a moment here. But one of the things he's he's doing a podcast. He does a horror podcast, and one of the things I hear him struggling with when he's sort of getting these ideas for what he wants to do for podcasting. Um, you know, he says, well, everybody's doing this and there's somebody doing this and there's somebody doing this. And I think that there's just this, he said, but I want to do this. This is the one I wanted. This is the way I want to do it. When I see myself doing a podcast on this topic, he does horror movies. Mm -hmm. he said, this is the way I see myself doing it. And I think that's like, I mean, I think that's half the battle. Cause like, if you, it's going to become work. And if you, again, it has to feel natural. Like mm -hmm. I, this is the way I want to do this thing. Look at how these author updates became like the top, they came the topic almost. Part it's of what we're crazy. doing. Should we, should we slip really quickly into what we're reading first and then go back? Sure. Or should we yeah, skip let's, that let's today? That. No, let's not skip what we're reading. I, I think that's, that I, I am about continuity and we have always <laughs> talked about what we're reading. We're not <laughs> stopping today. All right. I just finished reading Eat Smarter, book on oh. nutrition. And, um, yep. and now I started I hope, left. I hope that's what it's about. Yeah, it's Hopefully not a it's not book. about cannibalism. 
<laughs> no zombies in the making of this book. Yeah, right. Um, so now I'm reading total uh, page change. It's called The Ward Witch by Sarah Painter. Oh, yeah. It's a uh, fantasy, contemporary fantasy about a magical island or something like that. I don't know. I have, I'm just not into it very far. Maybe the second chapter. Cool. But I like Sarah Painter. Cool. I follow her. I like her newsletters too. <laughs> she lives in Scotland and I've read a lot of her other series and this is a new series. This is book one. So, and book two cool. just came out and I hadn't read book one yet. So I was like, all right, I got to catch up. Cool. I like it. What about um, you? What are you reading? I am reading... I'm reading Full Dark, No Stars by Stephen King. It's one of his collections. It's a collection of uh, novellas. And, you know, as I brought up earlier, like writing the novella right now, I'm, I'm I guess, just sort of priming the pump for, like, how do you tell a story in 40,000 words, 30,000 words mm -hmm. um, versus a, a rich story, a fulfilling story in a shorter form. Um and it's like, boy, you want to talk about four Stephen King stories of varying quality. Um, I mean, there's a couple of them that are really good. And one of them that's like, I can't believe I, I'm trying to finish this thing. Um, <laughs> so, but, so here's no the thing. No shade here's really, on Stephen King, but I you know, Stephen sometimes King. I love <laughs> you it, just can't hit a, them all out of the park. <laughs> well, but here's why. One of the novellas in the story is 1922. And it's set in, um, it's about a farmer who kills his wife and then deals with the guilt that he and his son experience over it. Um, but the reason I keep reading it is that the town that this is set in is connected to the stand, mm. which is a favorite of mine. And it's also connected in a strange way to it. It's where one of the characters from it goes to move between the first part and the second part. It's also part of um, connected to Billy Summers, a book I read a couple of summers ago. So it's like, even the stories that I don't love are so full of fan service mm. um, that it's like, okay, I have to read this to see if I can pick up the connection to the, the books that I really loved. He's just a great, tremendous author though. And the, the, as I've always said, like in the afterward, he talks about his process mm -hmm. for where these stories came from. So I, I'll, now I'm also finishing this novella again that I don't love because the character is pretty reprehensible, like because I want to see his inspiration and how that played all the way forward. Because again, like I liked, I know how my inspiration goes from, you know, germ to, to fully formed. And so that's always fascinating to me. But I'm also reading a book called uh, Ring Shout by P. Jelly Clark. Um, it's a, it's basically like a horror fantasy. It's about like, it's a, a blend of kind of horror and fantasy and historical fiction. It's basically like, it's a, it's told from the point of view of a bunch of African-American kids who in Jim Crow America and like the Ku Klux Klan is coming to life, but the Ku Klux Klan are actually monsters. Like they're, Mm -hmm. They're not just monstrous humans, but they're monsters. And so it's kind of this like fantasy in that these kids go out kind of like, I, th I think it's going to go the direction where these kids go out hunting clansmen and, and that might be satisfying to see some, some hmm. comeuppance for, for those folks. But mm -hmm. P. Jelly Clark is a really interesting author for anybody that likes kind of odd contemporary fantasy and, and things like that. So. All right. Love Let's talk about there. anthologies. I'm no publishing kidding. one. You're publishing one. What? I'm publishing one. You were in one. And I was just in one. Yes. What? How do we not? I, well, I guess this is the perfect time to talk about it. Yes. You were in one. I'm publishing one. <laughs> Have you been in? You've been in ones. I've before. been in many. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, um, how did you? So let's talk first about um, if you want to be in an anthology. Right. Like what the process is. First of all, I lucked out, I guess, big time. Yeah. This is who you know, <laughs> right. the time it and is. everything. So the bookstore that I, the bookstore owner, Tsunami Books, the owner of Tsunami Books has always wanted to have his own press. And during the pandemic, 
you know, on the, on the heels of the pandemic, he kind of just felt like that was going to be his project. And so he got Ken Babs, famous Mary prankster, yeah. um, who wrote a memoir about his friendship with Ken Kesey, who is, um, the Mary uh, Prankster. Yeah, the Mary Prank, but also like this literary icon almost in Eugene, Oregon, anyway. Oh my like, gosh. He's he super is like, famous here. So he is the like the literary icon of Eugene. I mean, who <laughs> he's I know people who aren't even readers or book people, and they like revere no his, who Ken I mean, Kesey is. Books. Yeah. 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 So so that was the first book that Tsunami Press published. And it was very successful, as you might imagine. Yeah. Uh, between yeah. all Built Ken Babs's audience. content, con contacts, and Scott's contacts, and you know, just our community and everything. So, so that happened. So the second book is this anthology that I'm in, and this was he wants this to be a regular thing. Already has the second one planned out with the title and who he's going to start asking. So he invited this first one is called bookstore clerks and significant others. So as a way, as a thank you, as a homage, you know, to all of the people that had helped the bookstore over the 28 years that it's been in, in around in the same location too, by the way. Um, so That's tsunami awesome. books is, is kind of a, an, I don't know. It's kind of an icon all by itself, really, for for the area. So he invited me as a clerk at the time to submit. So that was my in. And I'd never been in an anthology before. So I was really honored. And uh, and yeah, so that's how I got into that one. But Sweet. I know that people like submit and like, let's talk about different ways to be parts of an anthology. I've gotten in that way too. I mean, I had a, a old high school teacher that a, a journalism teacher that approached me. Um, so I think, yeah, I think one of the things we miss out on a lot and when it comes to anything is reaching out to people like that, you know, so I think if you, you're look, if you're thinking of breaking in, like maybe look at your network and see, um, I think I need to be reminded of that. Cause I think it, it sometimes feel like it's not legit if you, if it's somebody, you know, but it is, people it's totally legit it's totally um, legit i mean that's what networking totally is all for right <laughs> yeah right and and to be honest like every anthology everything i've ever been on the back side of it's there is a certain amount of i knew like i got here because i know someone and i think we need to de, de uh stop demonizing that mm -hmm. because it's just it's you are limiting it's a limiting belief yeah um, it kind of makes you feel like it's not fair that you got in because you knew the dude, but yeah. it totally is fair because it, again, it's all networking. It's all, I mean, that's part of the author job. Now, if you're in the author business to sell books, like you have to get out there and meet people and talk about your book. So if that's how yeah. you got in, then that's totally legit. Yeah. Yeah. And I, especially if it's early on, like those little boosts you get from people, you know, help get you to the people you don't know, because now that we, we can move on and talk about how you get into anthologies, you know, cold is you have to submit a story. And so in general, I mean, I guess we should start process wise. Like if you're, let's say you, you look for listings, like there's listings all over like currently mine is on Facebook and I've, I haven't posted it on any of the, the sites like the submission grinder or anything like that yet. But um, you, you go out and find them. There's all kinds of Facebook groups for, for calls for submission. I think you could probably Google search calls for submission anthology and you would find hundreds of them um, plus a, dozens of sites that aggregate listings. So I think it's, if, if you are thinking of trying to break in with a story of some kind, I think it would behoove anybody just to Google search, you know, kind of anthology, your topic and see what's out there, your, your genre, or if it's, I guess it's topic, if it's nonfiction, um, and then just see what's out there. So what is the difference between then um, an anthology 
and a journal, like a oh, university boy. press journal. Because actually, I see a lot of similarities. And I kind well, I of wonder, I think that anthologies could, anthologies often are genre. Um, often. You know, like Mostly. this is a horror anthology. This is a right. mystery anthology. The right. top, you know, 50 travel stories in 2024 or, you know, like it's a it's a collection of same genre stories or content. I think a magazine, you know, and I think about so I'm putting out a horror anthology, Pacific Northwest inspired horror. Right. So we're putting that out. We're we're sort of open until filled mm -hmm. until we get the, the the stories that we want, the balance that we want. And then we'll put it out and then we'll lick our wounds and see how much money we lost and then decide <laughs> if we want to do it again. Uh -huh. um, we very likely will go again because I think I actually don't see how it doesn't work out. <laughs> I'm saying that right <laughs> now on March 13th, 2024. I don't see how it doesn't at least break even. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it like that anthology then next time could be, you know, we could change the theme. It's back into the ground volume two a new a different subtitle maybe it's instead of pacific northwest inspired horror it's uh you know we may come up we may vary the anthology uh, from that but i think a magazine is more like it comes out quarterly it's you know it's regular there's like a rolling submission call mm -hmm. you know when i look at when i look at magazine listings when they're it's just there's a rolling thing we we read for the summer issue in the spring, or we read for the summer, the winter issue in the fall or whatever, however they do it. And so I think an anthology is considered like a one shot deal until, until proof of concept. And then it's, and then it comes out again. Okay. That's my concept, my, my idea of it. And, and that was a part of our discussion. You know, my friend Jim pitched me this idea. And so I'm also saying that because I'll blame him if it doesn't work. <laughs> um, you know, he said, like, let's just put it out. And, and, and well, first, the, what I was going to say was he, he said, well, do you want to do like a, a magazine, like a journal, um, like maybe once every six months? Or, and I thought, well, let's, let's see how we do with an anthology. Let's get our process down. Let's get mm, the, yeah, you know, like, it's all, and there's so many people who have such strong feelings about it. Like I posted on Facebook on Monday. I have been reached, a number of people have reached out to me that I know and, and strangers asking very pointed questions or correcting my assumption in the listing or, you know, so there's a lot of, there's a lot that goes into it. You know, I talked to Eric Witchie, who's a friend of, of, of both of us. And he's very clear, like I don't submit if it doesn't say this and I, if you don't say that, I'm not interested, even if you are my friend. So I think there's just some strong, like, yeah, I think the first, the first, first shot out the door, I realized like, you know, people take this very seriously. So one thing I want to slip in here, this seems like a good spot. Um, if you are trying to get your work published and you want to start an anthology as a way to do that, because if you do that, you can invite specific authors to, like we just talked about, you know, you can be invited to submit to the, to the journal or to the anthology. So if you right. do all the work, you know, if you get the cover and you get all the people and you come up with the marketing plan and you publish it and you do royalty splits, you know, like draft to digital makes it really easy to do that now. So that is another Avenue. If you're trying to get out there with a little bit of street cred and you want, you know, X author's name next to yours on the cover <laughs> to sell books, then that's another way to do it. That's another way to, I mean, network, really network and publish and build relationships. And, and the more work that you do yourself, the more likely, you know, 
X named author would say yes. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. I, so. I mean, that's what I was told by people that regularly make anthologies. I think that there's something like, I, I think there's something about like, I don't know. I mean, I think it's in anything creative, especially like I think doing is a great way of attracting like people are attracted to doing people are attracted to action. People are attracted to ambition. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I mean, attracted in like, they want to know what you're doing. They want to check, they want to check it out. They want to, you know, there's this like, I, I think that if you want to be circulating in bigger it was in, in more groups and in bigger groups and in more exciting groups and all that other stuff. Like you have to make a little bit of that water yourself, you know, it's mm -hmm. really hard to sit around and wait. Um, I think you just have to be like willing to, to, to like invite, you have to invite people over, I guess, you know, you could sit around and worry about why you're not getting invited to your neighbor's house. So why not just invite your neighbors over? And then it becomes like a feedback thing. And that was part of it for me, to be honest. Like, I felt that's like why I like indie publishing as a whole, anyway, versus trad publishing, because I like that that sense of control, and then not yeah. waiting for someone to accept me. Like, I accept me, so <laughs> just gonna do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's yeah. I think there's such a. I think there's a there's parts in this. Um, I think that curve is exponential, you know, as you go like in the big, but when you're in the beginning part, it can feel like you're not going anywhere. It can feel like you're just spinning your wheels and beginning of what being a writer, the, the process of becoming a part of the, the community, I think, mm -hmm. like, I th mm -hmm. um, well in that, yeah, that's part of being a writer is being a part of the community. I think in the beginning, as you're just like figuring out what you write, how you write, who you want in your tribe, what your tribe is, mm -hmm. all that stuff as you're figuring all that stuff out. Um, it can take a really long time. It can feel really defeating. So why not just give yourself like, like some action, like, all right, I'm going to do this thing. I know there's plenty of people we see in our world. I mean, we share a lot of our world overlaps you and I, and in the, in the literary side. And it's like, I see a lot of people just throwing stuff out there and like, Hey, I'm going to, um, Francis, who's a member, who's, who's a member of the community. I can't remember her last name. France. I was thinking just, she's, she just published an anthology, invited her friends to be in it. It's like, great. That's, that's a way to just keep the, the engine moving. So how did you and your friend decide to do this? Let's talk about process now. Like if you want, if, if listeners want to start an anthology, what are what are some tips to get started? Well, Jim and I, so my the story for of Jim and I, and I think we're gonna do some some we're gonna make kind of our story, our relationship part of our pitch. Mm -hmm. um, um I was making movies in about 2003, 2004, I was making movies. I remember uh, that a lot. Yeah. And my I had a film, I made a film. I worked on a, sorry, I worked on a feature film that was out here in Clackamas County and I decided I was going to make a film. And so I started making a film and one of the guys who was local. So one of the guys local on this indie production, who was a local, um, I think he was a camera guy or he was a, he was a, he was third camera on the feature film, but he was a local film guy. He and I decided to make movies together. And he said, well, I know a bunch of guys that hang around the camera shop and so let's let's get them to be our crew. So we invited these guys. And in this group was this guy, Jim. And Jim is like, you know, he, Jim's a distinct character. He's a hell of a lot of fun, um, you know, and he's, you know, kind of at that time, like kind of wisecracking, super smart, like new film, like crazy, um, you know, fun to have a beer with. And we just hung out a lot, talked movies and made, I think we made, he and I, um, made films together for about three years. I think we made six or seven short films or were a part of six or seven short films. That whole thing went by the wayside. I think, you know, I bought a house, got into a career. He got into a-, a Let me reframe that. By the wayside sounds negative. You pivoted. <laughs> yeah, right. We pivoted. Like, I think we, we, 
making short films as a way to get into making feature films just was not something either one of us felt like we could do. Jim got really ambitious about a project. Um, he followed it for a really long way. Um, it, I was not a part of that project. It was a different thing. Anyway, so Jim and I had this relationship. And actually, I hadn't spoken to Jim in probably 10 years um, before he reached out to me and said, hey, let's let's go get a beer. And we started a regular Thursday beer. And this is really the, the truth of it is his his production company that he's the owner and operator of was dissolving. Uh, and he said, well, I just want to do something fun. I'm, I'm started this podcast. I want to keep up that energy. You want to do an anthology. And I think at that time I knew how Jim worked. I loved, I love the way Jim works. He's passionate about horror. I'm passionate about publishing. I mean, I love horror, but also like a more, my bring the, the passion for publishing. He brings the passion for the genre. Um, and we're kind of helping each other along, right? Like I'm not as steeped in the world of horror as he is. So I'm kind of learning his taste and aesthetic and what, you know, how that would apply to an anthology. And he's learning about publishing from me. And so it's been this great, like, you know, I'm stepping into this pool new in one way and he's stepping into the pool in another. And, and yeah, like it just became, you know, we, we align on a lot of things and, and and that's that's how we got here. I think knowing knowing how the other one worked, um, we had rough conversations in our filmmaking time together. There were some really difficult um, production things. Some personal issues came in. So I think I think in the back of both of our minds, and we haven't talked about this, but I know that in the back of our minds, there's we both understand that like we also can disagree we also can like maybe we can have friction and move past it at this juncture in our lives. And I think there's going to come, there will come a time in this where I'm sure we'll run into an issue. And and I just am confident that our past will help def help move us forward. So for all those reasons, like I think we worked, we work well together. So We've had a guest on the podcast before who um, had a, started an anthology based kind of on the critique group that she was in, and and she has plans at, at the time of recording. Anyway, she had plans to you know do another one, but knew how she was going to do it differently, and so she did that kind of solo, but but kind of crowdsourced a lot of help with it. So you differently now are gonna you you've kind of come up with a it's like the same relationship with a co-writer you know you have to know how each other work you have to like have some sort of chemistry there you have to plan for what if this goes wrong what if that goes wrong what's our process so it sounds like you and Jim already kind of had that because of your history with right. the film and and so that's a great way to find a partner or a co-writer or a co-producer for projects um so what else have you done like what are the next whether a person wants to start an anthology by themselves or with a, a co-producer what is the first thing they have to do or think about okay that's a good question um, well, the first thing we like, we both sat down and I think probably had a hundred dollars worth of beer and burgers talking about what we <laughs> like, what we, what we don't like. Um, we, we have very similar interests in, in the genre and we were, cause if you put out an anthology call for horror, you're going to get everything from, you know, mm -hmm. psychological science fiction horror to slasher baby dolls and you know like you so we decided like what do we want to do like why are we doing this um once we decided that we both like the subgenre of folk horror um we like stuff that's very place based we like we don't like things that are you know splashy and and grotesque we don't like things that are mean spirit we created sort of like what's in what's out and we agreed mm -hmm. on it um at that point we felt like okay, now we know what we want in. What does it look like? Um, we kind of bandied back and forth. Like, is it is it an ebook? Is it a print book? Is it both? Um, do we do, how do we do audio? Like we, we kind of explored all the different iterations of it and we talked about what's in and what's out. Um, 
and and or or more importantly like what do we how do we get from ebook to print book to audiobook we talked about you know kind of a a best case scenario process i think that's important i think you have to know what you're shooting for um and i think what we're shooting for is in a year having you know a vibrant anthology with 15 stories that's in ebook that's in print that is also in that either is in production for audio or has been produced in audio but we also understood that we can't do all of that at once you know not on our budget like we and and how we would so how we would stage that i think that was really important that's kind of the jim jim's a producer he spent 15 years producing commercial video so he's very much into okay so we do the three dollar ebook and then use the hype around the ebook to 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 do the antho do the print anthology we use the print anthology energy to do this he could see that right he mm -hmm. could see the stages and so and those stages motivated him those stages got him excited um and then lastly it was getting the cover i mean that was like we we can't um you can't announce something in this world without a cover that sells it and you know when when we we went around and around i think it took us six or eight months to get a cover part of that lag was just practical life getting um in the way but we finally found a cover that we liked and we licensed it and we we put it out and and here we are so you've After got that, a cover was... before you know who the authors are so it'll be changed so we, then yeah so we have a cover that's a good question great question we have a cover that is um Right now, it's just the image. It's it's um, we we've hired an uh, an artist from uh, from England to we we license an image that he had done for just an illustration for a a book ebook print and audiobook cover, and that was something I was not up. You know, I was always told don't license original art. Jim thought it was worth it, so then we took that original piece of art and we had it made into a cover because there was no graphic on it mm -hmm. and then part of our arrangement with the cover designer is that we will come back and add names to the front of the cover and um, do the spine and back cover at that time so yeah it's like uh, people i mean in the indie world what's really gratifying again and again and again is that people are willing to work with you mm -hmm. <laughs> they're really just they're really willing to Yes, that cover designer wants the full dollar and cent amount for all of that work, but they understand that, okay, here's the way we're going to do this. And you just have to communicate what your desires are. Um, hey, we're going to come back and do this later. Um, is that okay? Yes. Mm -hmm. All right, so. cool. So then how do you decide what, in closing, <laughs> how do you decide what or to go about with the call of submissions. You said you put out a call for submissions. You said it's going right. to be open until it's filled. You want 15 stories. And, then... and that number, that number is negotiable also because, mm -hmm. you know, there have already been people that have, you know, asked, do we want, do you want um, flash fiction? Are you taking flash? And I've said, Basically, like I'm open to whatever I actually in the listing, it also says, uh, if you have anything longer than a short story, please, you know, ask mm -hmm. if you have a novella and you're and you think it's good and we think it's good, then let's do it. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, we put the listing together. Um, the, the listing is hosted on my page. We didn't buy a URL yet. We're going to well, we bought a URL, but we're not going to host it individually until well, just until a different time. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's hosted on my and my site. Um, I'm now all I've done so far is posted on Facebook, and it's it's kind of organically spread through people I know in the horror community. Thank you, Ronnie Stinger, for for sharing it. Mm -hmm. um, a couple of other people have shared it too, but Ronnie was like the first within five minutes of it being up there. She shared it, um, and I also shared it in a group that does um, that that just a Facebook group that does open calls to submission. And that's, so we've got 11 submissions so far in a couple of days, which is. Wow. Um, that's amazing. Yeah. I'm pretty excited. I'm. So I'm, what is the process then for editing that? Are you the managing editor? 
I am the managing editor. Um, we are, so our process is going to, Jim's, Jim is right now, while I'm speaking, he's in New York City doing a Food Network video shoot. Um, his company is closing, but his company is still holding on to kind of some last contracts. And so he's in New York shooting a, a Food Network video, which sounds like a lot of fun, but apparently <laughs> isn't fun. Um, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like that must be great. They must bring the, the bring great food. He's like, no, I have to do catering for the Food Network. <laughs> I'm like, that's what. Um, <laughs> so when he comes back, I think we're going to assess how many stories we have. I said I don't want to start reading them until we have like 25 or so. Okay, just because I want to be able to. I really want. I don't want to. I, I didn't want to get into the process where I was going to sit down and read them one at a time. Um, as they came in. I didn't want to do that. Um, I wanted to have enough stories in the in the hopper that I could say there's now again, I'm saying this out loud might it it'll feel a little complicated. but I didn't want to I wanted to have like twenty five stories so that I could say, I don't have to say yes to everything in here. I will mm -hmm. I have to say no to some things in here um, mm -hmm. so that i I wasn't like, I don't want to come at any of it from a position of like scarcity or need so that if there's only three stories that I, and that's our, that's been our, our number one conversation. I think that I, I didn't say that, but I think it's important to say, we have said, we are not get, we, we are, we know what's in, we know what we want to publish and we know what we don't want to publish. And I don't want to like, if in those 25 stories, there are only three that I feel are worthy of our of publication, then we have three stories we need to keep looking. Mm -hmm. If there are nine, then we have nine. Um, and then we, but we still need to keep looking. I don't want to get into that place where um, it's like, oh my God, I have to fill it with what I have in my hands. So I I've see. only scratched, I have only scratched the surface in, in seeking listings. Um, Jim and I really haven't done much as I think we're going to do some like Inst Instagram live stuff and we're going to start, we're just going to talk about it. And again, we're funny guys. I think um, we have a good story. We have an interesting rapport. So I think that between us, we, sh I think people will want to be a part of it. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, once those stories, once we, and I think we're going to accept as we go, that's the other thing because we are open to simultaneous submissions I think we're going to, ex like if if in this first batch, we like three, we are going to accept those three and then keep looking instead mm -hmm. of waiting in, until the end so that those stories are off the market. Yeah. Um, and then whenever okay. it's, whenever we get to the number, and I said 15, like if we end up with five flash fiction stories, then 15 isn't going to be enough. Right. I'd like to get to to seventy five to eighty thousand words because that's going to be a journal of a size that we can print sell for twenty dollars, which will help recoup expenses. So there's sort of an economic element in there mm -hmm. where, like, I don't want something slim that I have to sell at a bargain for ten bucks. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so there's, and Jim is really open to that too. He's he, whatever the number is that gets us to that meaty journal. We actually sat or, sit around at our favorite bar, the Tough Luck, and we like whatever book we're reading when we meet each other. It's like I want it to be that thick. No, mm -hmm. I don't. I don't want it to be that thick. You know. <laughs> so we, it's very much like yeah, there's aesthetics a lot of bookstore, and, yeah. yeah, aesthetics and bookstore fantasy going on in here too. Nice. All right. Well, that sounds like a really fun project. So if if you all have a horror story in you. Where can people it, submit that to you? So Jim and I, one of the other, gosh, now that we're at this part of it, like there's another step we formed. a. So Jim, Jim really wanted a logo for the press. He he wants to, he's committed to doing this full time, mm -hmm. like, like not full time as a paid job, because that would be silly. Um, but he wants to, he really wants to make this a, a long-term venture. So we are caretaker press. Um you can go to caretakerpress.org. That will direct you to uh, the listing on my site. If you just want to look at the listing and what we've done, um, feel free. And yeah, you go there. The submission guidelines are there. And send me a story. Oh, it's a cool um, it's a cool cover, too. I really like the title, actually. You never, ever mentioned the title. 
Oh, I gosh, I'm so bad at this. Back <laughs> into the ground. Back into the ground. It's it's a creepy, uh, creepy cover. I like it. Very cool. Thank you. All right. Well, uh, so if you have any uh, horror stories in you and you want to submit to Eric's new um, horror anthology project, you can go to caretakerpress.org and get all the info there. Uh, next week, we are going to be talking with author Kathy Giorgio on writing during prolonged illness. Um, and so I thought that was really important to to talk to new authors, especially because there's a lot of a lot of um, quote unquote industry standard, you know, where people are writing every day. You must write every day to build your yeah, yeah. writing habit. And I think that that's actually pretty harmful advice for a lot of people. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm anxious, not anxious. I'm looking forward to speaking with Kathy um, about her writing process during, you know, chronic illness. Excellent. Looking forward to it. Yeah. All right. Well, exciting news for you, Eric. Good luck Thank with you. all of that. And uh, we'll expect regular author updates on the process yeah i haven't checked i haven't checked the email yet this morning but i will <laughs> as soon as we're done here so see how many more submissions there are hopefully there's more. all right well i will see you next week see talk you next to you week. then take care everybody all right bye-bye bye-bye